Well, good morning. It is good to see you on Palm Sunday. If you're a guest, my name is Chris. I'm the pastor here. And you are joining us during our Lent message series. Lent is the 40 days before Easter that the church sets aside to prepare our hearts to celebrate the resurrection. And this year during Lent, we've been kind of slowly walking our way through Psalm 23 and exploring how it's not just a, a psalm of comfort that we hear at funerals or that you see, uh, you know, your grandma has cross-stitched and placed on the bathroom in, or on the wall in her bathroom or someplace like that, but it's actually a description of what life is like when we surrender to Jesus as our good shepherd. And so what we're seeing is how the presence of Jesus takes the realities that, that David describes in Psalm 23 and enables those to be our experience every day. And so I've been encouraging you this year during Lent to uh, do your best to memorize Psalm 23. And one of the ways that we're doing that together is by reading it each Sunday, uh, believing that as we internalize this great message, the Lord is going to bring it back to our hearts and to our minds in those moments uh, each day when we really need to be reminded of certain truths from it. So if you will read along with me, we'll start here in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This morning we are entering into the the part of Psalm 23 that we honestly probably wish was not there. It's that part there in verse 4 where David writes, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff they comfort me. I don't know about you, but given my preference, I would never need to apply this passage of Psalm 23. I would prefer to never walk through a dark valley. I would prefer to never be in a situation where I need God's protection, his correction, or his comfort, because that would mean life is just exactly as I want it to be all the time. And yet we know from our own experience that the darkest valley is unavoidable. When I was a senior in high school, it was actually the summer after my senior year uh, in Topeka, Kansas, I went to our youth group on a Wednesday night. It was one of the final services that I was going to be at before I left for college. And at the end of the service, our youth pastor gave us a chance to uh, pray and kind of respond to the things the Lord was saying to us. And so I, I found a spot at the front, and I was praying. And, and before long, my, my youth pastor was from South Louisiana. He was a, a true Cajun. He was a, a, just this giant man as well. And, and I, so I'm just kind of praying quietly, and I feel his two big hands on my shoulders. And then in his Cajun accent, he starts to pray. I'm not going to imitate it because... One, if I do it correctly, you won't understand me. And then uh, two, I'd probably just butcher it, make a fool of myself. But he, he starts to pray, Lord, help Chris to cling to you when the storms of life come. He hasn't known them yet, but Lord, they are coming. Help him when they come to know that you are the anchor of his soul. And I remember sitting down there in that little front space, that youth group room, and thinking, well, that's not very positive. Like, here I am about to launch out, you know, on my own, go to college, take on the world, and he's telling me, the storms are coming. Oh, Lord, be the anchor of his soul. And I just kind of thought, well, okay, probably someday they will. You know, by the time I'm 70, I'm sure someone I love will have died. You know, that, that was kind of my, my frame of reference for the darkest valleys. But, I mean, sure enough, and, and you've had this experience in your life as well, if you've lived very long at all. Bef- before long, my early 20s were a season of physical challenges that I'd never encountered before. It was a season of family drama that caused pain and strife that I would have never seen coming. It was a season of death and loss in our family that I I wasn't prepared for and, and came earlier than I had expected. And suddenly these prayers my youth pastor had prayed uh, were not something that was going to happen way off in the future, but they were my current reality. If you ever have the opportunity to study through Psalm 23 and especially read the the different writings and commentaries that have been produced on it, 
you'll notice what I've discovered over the past couple months, that this line, even though I walk through the darkest valley, you know, or maybe you're more familiar with the, the other version, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that line right there has produced more commentary and more material than any other section of Psalm 23. And the reason it has is because the dark valleys are a a universal part of our human experience. Because of the introduction of sin into the world, we experience these darkest valleys either because of our sinful choices. Sometimes we are thrust into the valley by the sinful choices of others. And sometimes we just have to walk through those because sin has thoroughly corrupted all of creation. And while Jesus has come to provide a way through and promise that one day he will restore and renew all things and and all of those darkest valleys will be removed, until that day comes, we will continue to walk a path that sometimes leads us through heartache, through disappointment, through doubt, through pain, through loss, through grief. We, we know this and we've experienced it. And I think that's why there, there's so much attention given to what does it mean for God to walk with us through the darkest valley. And as we read these, these short lines here that David writes, I think he gives us five lessons that we can lean on when we find ourselves in the dark valleys. Because whether we like it or not, they're coming. And when they come, God will bring these realities back to our lives to remind us that this has not caught him off guard and is not too big for him to handle. So the the first thing David teaches us is that we will walk through the valley. He doesn't say, when I walk in the valley, when I settle down, when I live there, when I set up camp. But he says, even though I walk through pointing us towards this idea that there is nothing that's going to come our way in life that God cannot lead us through. You might find yourself facing a a darkness that seems unending, that seems beyond your ability to endure, beyond your ability to defeat, but the message of the scriptures to us this morning is very clear. When God is your shepherd, he will lead you through. Where you are is not where you will always be. And so this morning, you might have walked in just under the weight of sin. And the message of Psalm 23 is God will lead you through to a new experience of freedom in life where those chains are broken and that weight is lifted. You might have walked in this morning just burdened down by grief and loss. And the message of Psalm 23 is God will lead you through. And it doesn't mean you're going to forget that loss. It doesn't mean you're not going to miss that person anymore. But it means the day will come that you don't have that heavy weight of grief on your chest anymore, that wakes you up in the middle of the night, that makes it difficult to breathe, that God will lead you through to the other side. Whatever we're dealing with, David tells us he will lead us through. It connects back to the previous line that we talked about last week where our good shepherd leads us along right paths for his name's sake. And it means even in the darkest valley, God has a right path out for you. You are not going to stay here. One of the greatest lies the enemy will tell you in the valley is this is permanent. You will never recover and you will never get out, so you might as well give up. What David is saying is, no, 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 he will lead you through. And and for some of you, that that is the only thing you need to hear this morning. You're in the darkness and God's specific word to you this morning is you're going to get through. You're not going to stay here. So keep following, keep trusting. The next thing David teaches us is that there is evil in the valley. This one I think is is important for us to understand because there there can be a tendency in, in some strands of Christianity for us to say, well, when I'm in the darkness, I can't acknowledge the darkness because then somehow it gets power over me. When I'm in the darkness, I can't acknowledge the evil because then it gains power over me. But that's not at all the case. David is, is telling us, even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And he's acknowledging there is evil in the valley. In fact, the valley, the darkness, is proof of evil. In God's original creation, there is no darkness and there are no valleys of the shadow of death. Every pain, every disappointment, every heartache, every ounce of suffering is the result of sin in our world. And so for us as Christians, we do not pretend that the evil doesn't exist, but instead we acknowledge it, we face it, and we recognize that we cannot handle that on our own. 
And as we begin to acknowledge the evil, it begins to point our eyes to our need for an outside rescuer. This is where Jesus comes to us as, what was their cry on Palm Sunday? Hosanna, God save us. As we confront the evil, it doesn't diminish the power of Christ. Instead, it highlights our need for him and reminds us that he came precisely because we were stuck in a darkness that we could not get out of. So there is evil in the valley, but David tells us that God's presence will drive out the fear that that evil creates inside of us. When we're confronted by evils of lack, of pain, of suffering, of death and sickness, it's natural for that to produce fear in us. A fear of the unknown, a fear of, of, am I going to be able to handle this? A fear of, I don't know how I'm going to get from here to there. And what, what David is telling us here is the solution to that fear is not to pretend that it's not there. It's not to tell yourself 10 times every morning, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid. It's to remember, the Lord is with me. And because he is with me, I will not fear. My fear does not reside in myself, but in the presence of Christ in my life in every single moment. Charles Spurgeon was a a pastor in England, and and at one point he was speaking about Psalm 23, and he told a story he had heard um, of a ship in England. And so it was full of people who uh, were accustomed to traveling on the ocean, but they got caught one day in a particularly bad storm. And the ship is being tossed and turned, and it's riding up, you know, the, those, those wild storms of the North Atlantic. It's riding up the waves and crashing down to the point that the, the adults who are there are starting to get very nervous. The crew are starting to get nervous. The people are starting to pray. There are some tears that are coming out. There's some panic in their voices. And in the midst of all of this, there's one little boy who is treating this like the world's greatest amusement park ride. As the waves go up, he's riding them up, and as they go down, he's jumping, and he's just having the time of his life, to the point that the the crew and the other passengers are starting to think, there's something wrong with this kid. Clearly, the lights are on, but no one's home, right? This this kind of experience for his child, and finally someone asks him, like, boy, what is wrong with you? Why aren't you afraid? And he turns to him, he tells him, well, my dad's a captain. He's got this. And he just lived in this assurance of all, for all of his life, his dad had been in charge of the ship. And for all of his life, his dad had brought the ship home and walked in the front door. And his dad had told him the stories of the storms and the big seas. But every story ended with his dad coming home. And so his whole life was built on this reality of dad's in charge, things work out well. Spurgeon said this is exactly what David is trying to point us to in Psalm 23. This reality that you might not have been here before. This might have caught you off guard. But your shepherd knows the way. Even when you walk through the darkest valley, he has walked on that path before you. And he knows the way out of it. And this is what the scriptures tell us, that we don't serve a God who is distant or far off, but Jesus Christ was tempted in every way just as we are. He knew the sting of betrayal. He knew the grief of, of mourning those that you love. He knew the power of death itself, and he faced it and defeated it and shows us the way out of it. And so when we are in that dark valley and we're surrounded by evil and we don't know what to do, Our peace does not come from suddenly figuring it all out, but our peace comes from knowing God is with me. I'm not the first one to walk here. I won't be the last one to walk here, and he is going to lead me through it. Then David tells us that that in the valley, God protects us. And here he shifts these last two things. He talks about how God protects us and he corrects us and, and uses some imagery of the shepherd that we're going to have to work a little bit to understand. So first he says, in the valley, God protects us. Your rod comforts me. And now we're we're all familiar with the shepherd's staff, the the tall stick with the curve on the end. You've seen it in every every child uh, that ever dressed up like a shepherd for Halloween or any other occasion. That's what they hold. Every nativity story you've seen, they're holding the, the shepherd's staff. But before David gets to the staff, he says, your rod comforts me. Now, the, the rod was a, basically a, a, a thick stick that had this heavy 
knob on the end. And actually, one of our officers was nice enough to uh, loan me the 2018 equivalent of the, the shepherd's rod. You know, and so, so you've got this thing, and, and the way the rod would work is the shepherd, his job is to lead the sheep, to guide the sheep, it's also to protect the sheep. And so he would have a sling or a stone. He would have, you know, if you go out to Wyoming, the, the modern sling and stone would be the, uh, you know, the 30-30 rifle. Uh, they're going to take care of the sheep. If they see the predators off coming towards the sheep, they're going to intervene. And so when David says, your rod protects me, your rod comforts me, it comforts me because it means I know God is going to protect me. That if evil comes, he is going to position himself between me and that predator. So for David, he, he tells us the stories later. He's killed the lion. He's killed the bear. Right? These are threats to his flock, and when it comes, he's going to try to fight them off with the sling and the stone, but if that doesn't work, he's going to grab his rod, he's going to position himself between the sheep and the predator or the thief, and he is going to give everything he has to deliver a, a beat down to remember to that enemy. So what David is telling us, I mean, it's, it's so, I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I, I didn't have an older brother, so I didn't get to, to enjoy this. But if you ever had an older brother and you ever got into it at school or in your neighborhood with with other people, or maybe some of you just had a a tough older sister that was meaner than all the older brothers anyways, right? But you got into it with some kids and there were four or five of them hanging around you and and you know things are about to get ugly. And suddenly your, your big brother, your big sister walks up behind you and they walk in the middle of the circle of punks and they just say, is there a problem? Right, and that's, and that's, especially if they're four or five years older than you, right? Your, your 13-year-old brother walks into the middle of eight-year-olds and just says, is there a problem? And it's, it's like Goliath has showed up. And they scatter, right, like cockroaches that you cut the light on, and they're gone all of a sudden. And in that moment, you have experienced what David describes in Psalm 23. Your rod comforts me. He's pointing us towards this idea that you will never face an enemy that Jesus has not already defeated. See, it's it's not just that he is bigger and stronger. It's not just that he can muster up his might and come stand in between and hold them off for a minute. It's that he has already perfectly and finally defeated that. And so there is no, okay, here we go, I'll roll up my sleeves, let's go again. It's just a reminder of, that's done. You don't even need to mess with that. That fear, that insecurity, that sin, that brokenness, it's gone. Death itself has no victory over you. The final word has been spoken. And so it's something, what you're facing this morning, the the scriptures are telling you, Jesus is bigger, Jesus is stronger, his victory is final and secure, and he is in the process of delivering that to you. And so even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Because guess what? If this valley ends in death itself, he has promised resurrection. He has promised that those who believe in him will never die. So he says, your rod comforts me. He also says, though, your staff comforts me. Now, God protects me in the valley. God also corrects me in the valley. And I love that God protects me. I don't necessarily like that he corrects me. Right? Just God take, because all the valley, you want to say it's their fault, take care of them. But sometimes in the valley, we're tempted to believe lies about ourselves. We're tempted to believe lies about who God is and how he works. And so he, he comes with his staff to correct us. Now, the shepherd's staff, again, it's, it's exactly what you're picturing in your mind. It's the long staff with the curve on the end. And the shepherd would use that to lead and to guide and to correct the sheep. So if they start to go off the path, he'll reach out and redirect them back into it. If one of them is is hurt or lame in the middle of the flock, he'll reach out and grab it and pull that sheep to himself. If two sheep are getting after each other, he'll reach that staff in and separate them and move them apart. And sometimes when we're in the darkest valleys, we start to believe these lies of, "I'm I'm the only one who's ever been here. Nobody else has ever suffered like me. No one else has ever experienced this injustice. And the Lord comes with his staff to direct our eyes back to the truth of scriptures. 
to direct our hearts towards the people he has placed around us who are actually walking through that valley with us. And as we do, he begins to remind us of who he is, what he has said he will do, and that the change that that brings to our heart. And it doesn't necessarily mean that then the light shines and all the darkness is gone, but it means in that moment, there is no fear because he is with me. Because he is protecting me and he is correcting me because he is my good shepherd who will lead me on the right path for his namesake. Dallas Willard uh, wrote a book called Life Without Lack. And it's, it's just this really beautiful exposition of Psalm 23. And, and he shows how the truths of Psalm 23 are played out in all of the scriptures. And when he, he comes to this portion of understanding how do we live through the dark valleys... And he starts to address some of the things we've talked about this morning. Well, we, we can't just ignore it. That doesn't do any good. Right? And so there must be some acknowledgement of it. But in that acknowledgement, we don't just sit down and wallow in self-pity. But in our acknowledgement, we're recognizing this is not how things should be. But the Lord is with me. And he will lead me from where I am to where he wants me to be. I want to share a few thoughts from Dallas Willard on that, that idea. He said, we need to engage in honest and thoughtful prayer when we're in the valley. Letting God know what we are going through, listening for his calming assurance that all will be well, and then acting in trust against the lack or the threat while praising God as we move forward with our lives. And so it's, it's this combination of I'm going to sit and, and be passive and remember that, that God is taking care of all of this. And yet I'm not going to sit here uh, forever and be passive, but at a certain point I have to start acting on the truths that the Lord has revealed to me. And so in a, in a season of lack, I don't have to pretend this doesn't bother me, but I can say, Lord, this bothers me. I need you to provide. And as he begins to lead, I'm going to get up and I'm going to follow and I'm going to experience his provision. And where I was is not where I'm always going to be. But uh, Willard goes on to talk about how sometimes life just brings huge challenges. And it's one thing to do this when it's just the, the little mundane things. But what do you do when the enemies are circling around you? I mean, the, the big ones, right? The, the big ones that you can't control on your own. And, and he goes back to the story of King Jehoshaphat in Second Chronicles chapter 20. Now, Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah. He is a descendant of David. And so it's probable that Je- Jehoshaphat has, has grown up with Psalm 23 being in his life in some way. He has heard the stories of David. David, for all the kings of, of Israel, for all the kings of Judah, David is always held up as the, the role model of this is what a king does. This is how a king lives. This is how a king leads. And so Jehoshaphat has, has heard these stories his whole life. And in 2 Chronicles 20, Jehoshaphat finds himself in a position where the enemies are attacking to the point that they have surrounded the capital city where he lives and where he rules and reigns, and and fear strikes his heart. We'll read a portion of that together. 2 Chronicles uh, chapter uh, chapter 20, verse 17 says, You will not have to fight this battle. This is the Lord speaking to Jehoshaphat. So the, the enemies have come. He's panicked. He doesn't know what to do. And so he acknowledges this, and he calls the people and says, Hey, let's pray and fast. Let's take time to listen to what the Lord is going to say to us. And God speaks. He says, you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions and stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. I mean, this is basically God saying, look, my rod will stand between you and your enemies. You're not going to have to do a thing. Now, Jehoshaphat has so much more faith than I do because his response is to say, tomorrow we go to war and we're going to lead with the choir. Now, I don't, I don't know. How many of you were ever in, have ever been in a choir, were in choir in school? Okay, I, I was in choir all through my four years of high school. It was a great deal. Our eighth grade basketball coach happened to be the high school choir director. And so in eighth grade, he would start telling all the guys, look, we always need guys in choir. It's an easy A. 
there's lots of girls and I'll let you watch some movies. And so he got a, a great turnout each year. Uh, but once we got in choir, it was pretty clear of like, oh, there are like real choir people and then there are us. Like you could tell these are his former players who he bribed to get in here. Now, now it wound up being a good experience. I, I enjoyed it. I like fake sang my way through all four years. It was wonderful. Um, but, but here's what I know. Like I made friends in choir. Uh, my sister, my brother, they did like the actual show choir, like they were all in. But as I looked around that choir room in my school, I never once thought I'd go to war with these people. <laughs> Not a single, t- and no offense, if you're a choir person, no offense. But I, I looked at the football team, I looked at the wrestlers, I looked at the rednecks and the ROTC, and I thought I'd go to war with any of them. Glitter and tuxedos? Not so much, right? Like, jazz hands don't scare enemies off. It's like, what are you? It just doesn't work. But but Jehoshaphat, he's so confident. The Lord says, you will not have to fight this battle. So Jehoshaphat says, okay, men, let's line up. Army, shields, swords, spears, in the back. Singers, in the front. You know, and they've got to be thinking, Why does Jehoshaphat hate the singers? What did we do to him? What did we do to him? Can he not sing? Does he hate the arts? Is he cutting our funding? You know, all of these kinds of things that are are coming up. But he says, no, get to the front. And they get to the front and, and then listen to this. We've got this next passage for you here. Verse 21. It says, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and praise him for the splendor of his holiness. As they went out at the head, not the shed, at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. So so what's happening here? They're going out and they're singing of God's love. Because it's God's love that motivates him to display his power on their behalf. Right? It's God's love, and, and so they go out, and you can read the rest of the story later. They go out, and the Lord delivers them in a miraculous way. He does what only he can do. In the darkest valley, his rod and his staff are more than enough. He is more than victorious. Dallas Willard writes about this passage, and he says, That is how we are to respond to life's difficulties and disappointments and the suffering that can and most likely will come to us. If we get ourselves out of the way and focus our attention upon the God of our sufficiency, then we too can be singing songs of victory with full-throated confidence. We can shout with Paul. Then he quotes from Romans 8, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I love that phrase that Willard uses. We we will sing these scriptures with full-throated confidence. We will take our place with the choir or behind the choir saying, the Lord has spoken and his purposes will be achieved. So go back to that that prayer my youth pastor prayed for me. I was 18 years old. I turned 36 this this past February. So for 18 years, until until last night at 10.30 when I'm reading through this message, for 18 years, the picture I had in my mind was that I am in a sea that is tumultuous. And the waves, are, the waves are rising and they're crashing and it's violent. And there's wind and there's rain and there's thunder and there's lightning. And in the middle of the sea, there is a rock. And in my mind, the picture I saw from the day he prayed that until last night at 1030 was of myself clinging to this rock and holding on to it. 
Right? And this was my approach in every dark valley I've walked through. Lord, I'm just going to hold on for everything I'm worth. I'm going to hold on. I'm not going to let go. I'm going to read the scriptures. I'm going to pray. I'm going to plant myself in church. I'm going to hold on. I'm not going to go anywhere. And it was great and it was good. But, but last night, at literally 1030 at night, I'm sitting in my bed. I'm reading through this message. And, and I hear the Lord say as clearly to me as he's spoken anything. You've never been holding on to me. I've been holding on to you. Right? It, you're on the rock, but you're not clinging with your grip in your own strength and your own might. You're on the rock, but, but in my mind, I always saw, Lord, it depends on me. And if I let go for a moment, I'm going to be swept away. He said, no, no, no. I have planted you on this rock. And the gates of hell are not going to wipe you off of it. When the winds blow and the waves crash against it, you will be there. Not because you've got a strong grip. Not because you've got a family history of serving the Lord. Not because you've got a seminary degree or can quote the scriptures. But you will hold on because I have planted you in the rock. And you cannot be swept away. And so for some of you this morning, you are in the dark valley and you are holding on with everything you got. And the message of the Lord to you is, you're never going to be strong enough. You're never going to be holy enough. You're never going to be good enough, but that's fine. Because it's not on you. It's on me. And I have planted you on this rock. And you will not be swept away. And you will not be overtaken. Man, boy, I, I tell you what, 10.30 in my bed last night, it's that moment of like, man, Sunday can't come fast enough. This is good news. The pressure's off. The victory's won. All that's left to do is get with the choir and with full-throated confidence, sing the songs of victory. This is what God has called us to. This is the experience of so many of us. This is the promise of the scripture. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Will you stand with me? I want to pray for you. And then we're going to do exactly that. The band's going to come and they are going to lead us in songs of victory. That we will sing with confidence that what the Lord has promised he will do. God, we come to you today. You see our hearts, Lord. You see our needs. But God, we, we thank you that you are big enough and you are strong enough. Lord, we thank you that it's not on us to cling and to hold on. But the victory has been won for us. So Lord, I pray for those who are suffering from grief this morning. May they know that they have been established in you and they will not be washed away by the waves that come. Pray for those who are burdened by the weight of their sin. May they know that the victory has been secured, that the enemy has been defeated and they can walk in the new life you are leading them into. Lord, for every darkness we experience, we thank you that you have shown us the way out. So now, Lord, we, not, we don't just rest in your victory, but God, we proclaim your victory. We shout your victory. We sing of your victory. We thank you, Lord, that what you have promised you will do. Lord, bring hope, healing, and salvation to us this morning. We need you, Lord. Hosanna, save us. We thank you, Lord, that as we cry that, we're not getting your attention, but we're reminding our hearts of who you are. You are the God who saves us. You are the God who comes down into the middle of our mess to lead us out. So God, may we know you're never going to let us go. You're never going to turn away. You're never going to come up short. You're always going to be strong enough. In Jesus' name, amen. As they lead us in these songs, if you've got needs in your life and, and you need someone to join with you, head out those back doors to the prayer room. We're going to pray with you. The rest of us, they're going to lead us in a couple songs just declaring the victory of God in every situation.